Welcome to Faith in Politics, a show dedicated to discussing issues surrounding the intersection of church, state, and politics, and the examination of whether you're allowing your faith to shape your politics, or are your politics starting to shape your faith? In other words, what do you do when God and government come face to face? I'm your host, Orlin Johnson. Let me introduce you to our guest panelists for today. First, we have Dr. Andrew Polk who's the Associate Professor of History at Middle Tennessee State University and the author of the critically acclaimed book, Faith and Freedom, Propaganda, Presidential Politics, and the Making of an American Religion. We also have with us Ms. Bettina Krauss, who's the editor of Liberty Magazine. We have Dr. Barbara William Skinner, the CEO and co-founder of the Skinner Leadership Institute, public policy strategist, faith and community leader, lecturer, and an educator. And we also have Mr. Rashern Baker, who's the president and CEO of the Baker Strategy Group and University of Maryland professor of public policy. Ladies and gentlemen, good having you here with us and looking forward to our conversation for today. You know, there's an interesting concept as it relates to religious freedom, that it should be a matter of choice. But there are certain parts of the world, in particular in countries like India and Pakistan, where we are seeing things like forced conversions of women that are starting to become a pressing issue. It's starting to push against the principles of individual freedom, religious choice, societal harmony, and it starts to find ourselves in a position where we're seeing legal experts that are concerned and citizens that are grappling with a lot of these particular issues. In India, for example, we're starting to see a lot of issues regarding conversion of women from majority communities that have been stirring a lot of resistiveness among various segments of the population. I think what's really important is here in America, we believe, that we never have to worry about any of these type of things. Issues like special marriage acts that are taking place in other parts of the world will never impact us here. But the fact of the matter is, just because it's not happening in my backyard today does not mean it should be something that I should never worry about because if it's in somebody else's backyard, one day it may be in your backyard. You know, Bettina, you have had a chance to work on a worldwide basis and also on a local basis. When we see a lot of these activities that are happening that seem to really push against individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds, how should we from our position here in the United States be looking at this and really engaging and understand that this is something that could end up impacting us in some way and even find ourselves in a court system? So, Orlin, these laws are fascinating, uh, especially the law in India, which is a law uh, in one of the most populous states of India against the forced coercion of women through marriage, with the idea being that a minority religious man, such as a Muslim, marries a Hindu woman who's a member of the majority faith. Uh, and through that process, somehow coercively um, converts her. But here's the thing. This, these laws uh, are targeting a problem that is minimal at best and non-existent um, in many situations. They are being used, these laws, as propaganda by far right-wing Hindu nationalists. Mm. Now, we, we talk about Christian nationalism here in the US. Well, religious nationalism is a global problem. In India, Hindu nationalism is a problem. So you layer this idea that to be a true Indian, you have to be a Hindu. You layer that with ideas such as religious minorities that are be feared. You layer that against the idea that um, women occupy a certain place in society and that in the Hindu system, the caste system needs to be preserved. And so it, it creates this combustible idea. And so you have these very few cases that are being blown out of proportion by religious nationalists to achieve a certain public policy uh, position and posture. You know, Dr. Polk, I think we see a lot of this similarities where Christian nationalism can be viewed as almost wrapping the cross inside the flag. And here we're looking at other countries that are basically wrapping their religious uh, rituals in another flag, very similar, even though it's on completely different sides of the world. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is, uh, as Bettina said, a, a worldwide problem, uh, and it gets more complicated in these types of situations, right? Religious conversion is already uh, a messy issue throughout the world. 
um, particularly through marriage, right, of, of what family traditions are, of what people think that this is who we are, and if you become something else, are you still a part of our family in the same way? Uh, the difficulty we see here is when nation states do the same thing, right? That when uh, Prime Minister Modi is saying, as Bettina said, that you to be Hindu is to be Indian, and to be Indian is to be Hindu, well, then what other location is there for any minority groups? Um, and I do think this is uh, a question that Americans need to look at, because if nothing else, it allows a comparison that isn't as familiar. Uh, it is a question of when people talk about white Christian nationalism or America is foundationally a Christian country and should always be. Well, these are the types of implications that people don't usually think about, um, often because it's being used fear-based to say you have to protect yourself. They're coming for you. They're coming for you. Dr. William Skinner is somebody who works a lot in public policy and, and realize that helping to shape arguments on laws and concepts moving forward, seeing this type of activity must be a little bit uh, chilling in some way, especially when you kind of see the, the points that really Dr. Polk just mentioned with the similarities with Christian nationalism even here in our country right now. Yeah, I think Dr. Polk and Ms. Cross are absolutely correct. Uh, there is a, re a strong relationship between intolerance for diversity, diverse views, diverse opinions, diverse people, uh, diverse voting, and religious intolerance. And so we, we would like to think that America is the harbinger of freedom uh, and that we're the one to monitor the world, but you can see that right now in our own country, uh, the minority, is uh, whether they're racial minority or minority in any way, are having their rights uh, threatened right now. And I, I, what is sad is that our faith is the most important thing we have. Mm. It is so fundamental. And when you have um, white Christian nationalists basically using their, misusing, I should say, their power, right, mm. to stop other people from voting, stop black and brown people from voting, uh, using that power to tell people how they should think, to ban books that they may not like in schools. And the books are the most fundamental way of raising a generation to think. Uh, so we are very concerned about the number of, of uh, states right now that are have ant have book banning uh, laws that they're growing. In fact, uh, the oversight of libraries being taken over by state mm. legislatures. So this concept of religious intolerance mm. is it's frightening. It has a lot to do with money and power. Who's in power and who's deciding? And we're we're on the brink right now, frightfully. Uh, looking at another election in a year, saying, will democracy stand? Uh, is it on the chopping block? Uh, when, some, when, when a leader says, uh, any leader, uh, the Constitution may not be all that there is, hmm. then you have to wonder, what does post-democracy look like? So I think legislators and policymakers, whether they're in Congress or, or state, uh, really are uh, being challenged right now to think about how you protect democracy, no matter what your party is. The democracy works for everybody, both the minority and the majority. You know, Mr. Baker, I gotta ask you this though. We used to always look at America as being probably like the, the standard bearer. You know, have we gotten to a point where we may have even lost our credibility in going out and making the arguments as to demonstrating that this is something happening here that shouldn't take place, but it looks like the rest of the world can sometimes point back to the United States and say, but look at what you're doing here. I mean, are we even losing our, what I would call our positioning in the world to be able to be the moral compass per se as it relates to religious freedom? No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, Dr. Skinner, put uh, the nail right on the head. Um, you think about it, Angela Merkel, when she was chancellor, actually said those words about America uh, when uh, the former president who's running for president again was in office. Uh, you think about the fact that India is the largest democracy in the world, and they're doing, they're going backwards, they're not going forward, and they can point to America as an example of that. Uh, one of the things that, you know, Dr. Skinner talked about, the banning of books, right here in the Washington region, Virginia, the governor run, won an election on that. 
just think about it. The, the, the state where Thomas Jefferson wrote about religious freedom is the one where we're actually going backwards on banning books, making folks who are in the minority, whether they are religious minorities or whether they are racial minorities, um, feel that they're not a part of this country and that we need to go backwards. I think it's a very dangerous time. And this question is not, like you said, not just for what is happening overseas, but we as the place that should be the light have dimmed ourselves by um, going backwards in, in terms of religious freedom. You know, Dr. Polk, the question regarding a lot of this activity, we're starting to see really students on campuses now beginning to take positions on a lot of these issues. I mean, we see what's going on, for example, with, with Israel and Hamas and, and Palestine, and, and we're seeing movements that are taking place on campuses. Are our young people in our institutions, are they actually informed enough to kind of even understand what side of an argument to be on, or are we seeing emotion without you know, the information, and, and if that is the case, then that means that fits right back into the point that Dr. Skinner was raising where we need more books and information so that people know what side to really be on. Yeah, I, I think the, the lack of information is profound. And as, as people have noted, right, the lack of disin or the, the amount of disinformation, right? If young people are primarily getting their information from TikTok, we have issues, right? Not because TikTok is necessarily about it itself, but because where does the information come from? And when everyone is worried about elites, uh, which are generally, hopefully, people who are experts, right? When experts can't have an opinion because they're experts, it becomes even more dangerous. I, I think for, for this comparison of the topic, probably the, the most apples-to-apples -apples comparison in the U.S. is uh, what's called the Great Replacement Theory. you have heard this, which is just an unabashedly racist and xenophobic um, tripe that says, right, the worry is black and brown people are coming into the U.S. and they're going to ruin America. They're going to bring down America, often through intermarriage, right? And they're going to somehow pollute the great system of America, which is, in the end, white and Protestant Christian. Um, it's a pretty explicit comparison to what is happening in India and Pakistan, and yet it doesn't cause the alarm that I think it should. A great great alarm uh, that, that's taking idea of patriotism and faith uh, in directions that are just absolutely deplorable. But Tina, where do we go with this? You're somebody who has to write on a lot of these topics to keep people informed, but yet we're seeing that we are dealing with a society that feels like really they get their information from other places, but who knows if it's <laughs> trustworthy information. So how, how do we help our public or what do we do to really help our society in some way? All in, I mean, that's a million dollar question. I wish I had an answer. But, you know, as, as Dr. Polk has, has pointed out, Dr. Skinner, um, Dr. Rishan Baker, preserving this space for dissent in American society is what built America and it will keep American democracy strong. Mm. And that is what we need to focus on. We need to take the example of what's happening overseas and allow us, allow that to guide our actions in preserving this space for dissent. Mm. And I'm gonna to have to let that be the last word, but I think we are seeing that this is gonna be a national problem that we will have to continue to work with. And hopefully as we continue to get more information into our society, in particular our young people, we'll find ourselves in a position where we will become you know, a more perfect union. You know, there's a case that I was taking a look at that was called Carter versus Southwest Airlines. And in that particular case, we found that we had flight attendants who were part of a union, that they were attending a woman's march in Washington, D.C. And apparently this didn't sit well with one of the individuals who was a longtime flight attendant who actually complained about this event and came to the conclusion that this was something that was despicable, which was led by a union president, and the idea that what was going to be supported was individuals would be able to utilize paid leave to be a part of this process. She came to a conclusion that going out and supporting this was violating some other beliefs that she had as it relates to abortion. The whole other thing ended up, ended up in court. She then filed a lawsuit claiming religious discrimination, and a jury held in her favor in Texas. The airline basically appealed the decision. 
That decision then ended up going up to the next level. Uh, Southwest ended up sending some messages to the court to try to explain why they decided to engage in this. But they were basically saying that they don't discriminate from Southwest Airlines standpoint, but this was just something that they saw as being something that seemed to be, I would call it benign in some way. You know, Rashawn, when you look at these type of cases and we're starting to see that there's people who have questions and then you're starting to see judges who are trying to figure out how to actually come to final conclusions and in some instances even deciding there's some religious training that you may need down the road. Oh, and by the way, I got a great place for you to go and get that done. Now are we finding ourselves in a situation where not only are courts basically telling us about religion, but then also maybe we want to send you someplace so you can be indoctrinated in some way from a corporate perspective. Am I missing something or was that an overstatement there? Uh, no, I think you I think you're absolutely correct. That is the fear, quite honestly, and it's is very real. You're now starting to see a changing um in America around these whole issues of not only the corporations, but the but the courts, as you just said, especially the lower courts that are now putting their thumb on the scale in favor of one religion over another. Um and they're doing it in a way that's almost um, hard to detect because they do it around an issue that they say they're going after, whether it could mm. be a woman's right to choose, uh, hiring who you want, whatever it is. But it tends to lean back toward um, favoring uh, a religious belief and really taking us to, I think, something also very dangerous. And that is a national religion uh, in the United States something that we this country was founded on against. People came here for freedom, um, and especially freedom of religion. And so I, I worry about uh, episodes like this case and uh, others. So I think you're absolutely correct. You know, Dr. William Skinner, the idea that somebody might need religious liberty training sounds good in concept. But when my judge decides that he knows the exact place you should go and get that done, I got to ask myself, have I gone a bridge too far there? I think the um, the plaintiff actually needed anti-harassment training because the plaintiff really was not harmed. Uh, you know, as we think about the Title VII of the 64 Act, she was not directly harmed, which really goes to the question of, uh, as uh, I think Dr. Baker said, of establishment through this jurist. He's mm. basically, I've got the I've got the gavel. My uh, party is in power. Therefore, I will rule no matter what the facts show. Okay, there, there is no real harm to this person. That means anyone, everybody's exercise of their rights probably harms another person or it's a gamble. Every decision that I've made, I was not always a religious person. What I love about this country and about uh, the, this, uh, the amendment, uh, the establishment and the free exercise is that I, I had the right not to be religious at all. Right. We're getting to the point of saying, if you, if whatever your choice is, if it's not the majority choice, this is a very dangerous position we're taking. America is not the kingdom uh, of God, and this is not a, a Christian nation. All right. So the question is in this, the kind of diversity we have in this country not, not only in this country, but abroad, uh, this is a dangerous precedent. I, I, I have heard that the Speaker of the House uh, once said that uh, we should have a, you know, this should be a Christ, become a Christian government. What, is, what do we do with people who don't believe that? Do they have, a, do you have any access? Do, any, do they have rights as American? Mm. Is their citizenship threatened now? Is their right to vote going next because they don't believe? I think we're on the threshold of some very dangerous times. Now, it also is a reason why you need to vote. <laughs> this is an argument for voting your values. Uh, but I will say right now uh, that I'm grateful to be in a country where I can decide to believe or not believe. But I And I am not ashamed to say that I am a Christian, but I'm worried about the way that a lot of Christians are now working away from the gospel, waking, working all the way away from any truth in the sacred scriptures toward a political doctrine that they call now their faith base. That, that's a dangerous point that we have reached. Absolutely. And Bettina, I got to ask you this question. When you think about the idea that 
uh, this judge actually had an organization that he could send you to for religious training really off the tip of his tongue. It makes you kind of wonder, you know, we're supposed to be dealing with jurists that are supposed to be balanced in some way. But as I think Mr. Baker may have mentioned, it seemed like the thumb was on one side of the scale when he decided where that religious training should take place when he thought maybe the Alliance Defending Freedom entity was the place you should go and do that. I mean, what, what is problematic when we start seeing that? Or is it not problematic? Maybe he wanted that just to be a starting point for them, but not necessarily the final resting place on their thoughts. So, Orlin, I think for a start that this whole scenario points to the fact that we are fractured as a nation. This um, decision comes out of the Fifth Circuit. And I think I would, I think I'd argue that it's the only circuit that this decision could come out of, uh, because this is a you know a conservative circuit which has you know created some problematic precedent mm. uh, in recent times. Um, you know, if it was coming out of the Ninth Circuit, a more liberal, you know, it, I don't think we'd get the same result. So I think the ultimate outcome of this case we're going to have to watch as it as it moves away from from Texas. Um, ADF Alliance Defending Freedom, well. They have a perfect right to exist and to advocate for their positions. Uh, that's that's part of their right as, as American citizens. Um, but I think it is problematic that a, a judge, a federal judge, would um, mandate training from an organisation which is so clearly on the record on uh, certain ideological issues which are polarizing and divisive. Um, I think that's that's the core problem with this issue. But, um, you know, I don't think we've heard the last of this case. You know, Andrew, when we start to hear these type of decisions, on one hand, religious groups may say, oh, it's great. They're trying to give them some religious training. But on the other hand, there are people that work in this area that start to say, these are the types of decisions that cost secular or non-religious people to say that these religious groups are just getting a little bit too much bang for their buck, you know, that they're getting a little bit more coverage than they deserve. Do you see any similarities to that? Or, you know, what are your thoughts in particular? I mean, you've written a book on a lot of these topics where you talk about propaganda and, and the creation of a religion, which almost can fall into some of these boxes. You know, tell us what you think. Yeah, I the shift in uh, the legal issue of religious freedom uh, has been extreme and very recent, right? Usually when we talk about religious freedom, um, laws, policies, it's about protecting religious minorities. Mm. Now the shift seems to be not so much freedom to practice your religion, but how much does your, your religion give you the freedom to discriminate against people who don't agree with Mm. Right. That suddenly is what religious freedom means. And it's from the majority. It seems to feel like they've lost the power and this is the way to maintain the power. Mm. Um, that's that's a very different and very disturbing understanding of freedom. It's not freedom. Right. Freedom is everyone being allowed to worship and, and, and view and have their religious views of themselves. This is what it's supposed to be in America. Religious freedom isn't you have the freedom to impose your religion upon others who don't hold it. And that seems to be what these cases um, have consistently dealt with. Uh, and, and I do worry about the ways that this becomes entwined with a, a civil religion that says to be American is to be Christian and a certain type of Christian. And therefore, if you're a Christian of that certain type, you can't have any of your rights and privileges and reality power taken away from you. That is an incredibly dangerous cycle that historically has always ended really poorly uh, for minority groups. Uh, and I do think it's, it's really worrisome right now. You know, Dr. Skinner, we're talking about a trajectory going in a direction as it relates to how people look at religious liberty and religious freedom and, and questioning whether or not, you know, how badly does it infringe upon what I believe as opposed to the idea that we should all be free to believe what we want. How do we turn that truck around? How do we slow it down? How do we unring the bell? Or, you know, has the cow left the barn and and we're just, you know, we're, we're, just, we're just chasing it from behind forever, it looks like. You know, if you think about our country, the pendulum swings back and forth. Uh, I think we've got, you get to an extreme, then people wake up and they think, no, we don't want to be that. Mm. I think we're at that extreme that 
uh, that was just spoken about uh, by, by Dr. Polk, that we haven't gotten to the end of it. That's what's so scary right now. We haven't gotten to the end of judges like the one in this case, um, imposing their, I would say almost ridiculous, training, mm. if you call it that, uh, on another person. What we need to be doing now is more of what I think Ms. Krauss talked about, and that is conversations with one another. Mm. Have a conversation with, that are maybe uncomfortable with people we don't even agree with. I mean, for example, in this Israel uh, Hamas war, a black clergy, basically who I connect with, were committed to Israel's security, but deeply concerned about uh, million. Now you're talking about over 10,000, largely children being murdered. Is that not a humanitarian issue that people of faith ought to be worried about? Do we get to pick sides? So we call the imam. I mean, and we call the rabbis and we have, we're having conversations with them. They're not always comfortable, mm -hmm. but, we, but, but we had, we gave each other the, the privilege of hearing. So I, I don't agree with the way Israel's going about this right now. I think their leader is awful right now. I think, but they have a right to believe what they believe. The question is how many of us have enough confidence <laughs> in ourselves to be able to hear something we don't agree with. And I think the more, and thank you for this program, the more people begin to understand that um, so, uh, all that it takes for evil to thrive, as Edwin Burke said, is that good people do nothing. Silence is not golden. When, when the religious minority or when black people or brown people or any oppressed people are being harmed in some way, and the majority is silent, that's consent, that's dangerous. We all feel convicted to operate outside of our comfort zones and begin to bring more people who don't think, vote, and act like us into our conversations. I'm gonna have to let that be the last word, but you're right on point, Dr. William Skinner, the idea of conversation and having it in a civil manner is where we need to go in order to see some real change take place. Hey, Bettina, tell me something I don't know. So the last case we talked about, Southwest Airlines, was about use of social media. Did you know, Orlin, that 77% of employees use social media at work and the average employee uses 12% of their time on social media at work? Now, that's a disturbing statistic. <laughs> yes, it is. Dr. Polk, tell me something I don't know. Did you know that when India and Pakistan first gained their independence, uh, Mahatma Gandhi's original plan was to move to Pakistan because he was concerned of how religious minorities in each group, uh, Muslims in India and Hindus in Pakistan, would be treated. So he'd rather go where he could do the best good. Wow, did not know that. Dr. William Skinner, tell me something I don't know. We're in the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area. Did you know that despite the enthusiasm over both the Ravens and the commanders, neither one will be in the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> that one I think I might have kind of knew. <laughs> Rashern, tell me something I don't know. Did you know that I think uh, come 2025 that the U.S. Senate will have the highest number of women of color in the U.S. Senate? Wow, that would be quite a change. Ladies and gentlemen, appreciate that conversation today and all the newfound information as well. Thanks again for being here with us. Hope you enjoyed our conversation. Just remember, if it's about God and government, it's faith and politics. See you next time.